Hey, everybody, I'm going to just get going with announcements um, as we get going until we convene the panel here with the room and Michelle Lee, or the room came with Michelle Lee. Um, I want to open, though, first ask everybody to um, give a little bit of recognition to Alan. You know, Alan, like several years ago, said he wanted to. Uh, do a recognition for like Pythonista of the month or anything, and I, I think this morning um, Alan really uh, earned that. Um, we had a person in crisis on Slack, somebody that, as far as um, we could determine as organizers, um, nobody we knew had a particularly strong relationship with. Um, and Alan really had been pushing that as soon as he got up this morning finished it, including making a call to 911. To um, The police were able to locate the person and they were going to make a welfare check. Um, but just think about everything that Alan had gone through. None of us have had training in this. And we've never gone through any kind of formal discussion about how to handle something like this. Um, so can you guys all give a round of applause for suicide and that's a person by the name of Aaron Schwartz. Who knows who that is? Um, Aaron Schwartz uh, is somebody that my best friend Brian Ray actually taught Python. Um, Aaron's father hired Brian to teach him Python and then you know, Aaron went on with RSS and was one of the creators of Reddit. Um, but he had a long history of really not getting along with a lot of people and, and he needed a lot of help. He didn't get it. You know, probably in part is a lot of people gave up on him. So when you see somebody in distress, I hope you uh, have an open mind and think about, yeah, this person's not particularly likable, but they need help, and try to override that and think about the person they could be rather than who they are right now. Okay. Seattle's largest tech user, centered around a language or a tech tool. Uh, I'm Alan. Actually, I think. Code of conduct, in short, be nice to each other. I think I've covered this a little bit in the opening remarks. Um, go beyond that is. Uh, you know, actively try to be welcoming. Um, I think we've got the, um, Eric Holscher, who's one of the co-founders of High Cascades. He does read the docs and write the docs. He uh, um, had put up a blog post about Pack Emerald. Um, following that, Guido had made a promise that he was gonna try to meet something like 30 new Pythonistas every day. And Guido Van Rossum is the creator of Python. Thank you, the room. Coffee meets bagel. Um, I'm really excited about what Arun and her uh, fellow founders are doing in investing in Seattle. Um, it's a thesis that I've kind of uh, told people for quite a long time that there's a lot of value for startups like hers to come here and hire the very talented Python engineers that we have in this room. Um, you've got to consider now with five puppy members on our team, 
her commitment financially um, to the economics of uh, Seattle is getting close to a million dollars a year. And she has every intention on growing that. So check with her team. Um, a lot of you know members of her team and uh, would probably like to work with them. So um, give a big shout of applause for her room and Hoffman's table. And thank you to CBRE, UFLA, uh, Mayel really pushed that forward and um, told them that they should really join. CBRE's been a great supporter, and Quentin has really driven that relationship. Quentin, stand up, please. Um, Rover and Algorithmia couldn't make it, so we missed them. Are you new here? Who's new? We have a lot of new RCPs. So one of my friends, Fortunato, is here. He didn't realize that um, other than one meeting once, um, we've always had beer. Because he's like, is there going to be beer? <laughs> we have, and you know, I've written this, um, said this to members. I'm really worried that uh, too much of my case is reflected in Puppy because we finished uh, 10 cases of uh, logging news before. <laughs> so if you've been here before, all those folks who are newcomers, please welcome them. Uh, Pac-Man roll, I went on that. Volunteers, volunteer scan, we're all volunteers. Nobody's making any money off of this. Actually, some of us have spent a ton of money. <laughs> members on there. Q&A is particularly helpful. Um, we have people like Bill Roos, who's in the room, who's the author of Data Science from Scratch, using Python, answering questions and trolling people. Like <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, beginner friendly. Nights are every Thursday and galvanize. It's a more informal yeah, meeting. Um, people are working on their own projects. It's pretty self-directed, but people can jump on Slack for help as well if there's uh, nobody there. There's an option. Scientific SIG is a great group. They program great uh, talks. Um, those are the uh, leaders there, Cy Kurt and Manda. Manda. Who's, is Amanda here? I don't know. Adam is something Quentin got going from patterned after what he was familiar with was uh, Vancouver. Um, and it's huge. And they just finished their first uh, workshop. How was it? And there's going to be another one coming up. And that will be currently. Mentorship program needs mentors. Um, somewhere here, Andre, you're helping out with those commits on on that app. Andre? Uh, practicing coding interviews on Monday. Lots and lots of events. Um, if you have a particular interest, we'd probably help you get it going as a SIG. Um, Want to speak? So, Alan had built Nerd Herder. It's, uh, ESPython.com, you can submit your talks, it'll blow up our organizer channel, we'll all see it, there's a lot more visibility so we don't lose. Um, speakers, if you're a first time speaker, if you're hesitant, we'll find you help, a we'll coach. Uh, Podcast Stage is coming! Woo! <laughs> and let's get going with our panel. Who's constituting our panel? <laughs> Just think of all the planning that went into getting a room and Michelle here at, at similarly pregnant. <laughs>
Thank you, Don. Uh, my name is Michelle Lee, and if any of you actually watch local television, I'm on K5, um, and also download the app. But um, we are on a new show called Take 5, which airs every day at 4, and it's about really advocacy and community-based projects and taking um, kind of some of that commodity news out of the equation, like the fires, the murders, the assaults. And we look at what's innovative and new, and King 5 has been really awesome about giving us an hour uh, to change the format of local news. So if you have a project that you're working on, or you're innovating, or you know someone who's doing something awesome, please look me up on social media, and um, we would love to feature you, because we think that those kind of stories make a real impact in the community. So again, my name is Michelle Lee, and I'm at King 5. I will say, I'm going to make myself a little vulnerable here because my husband is a developer and he talks about Python and he talks about like all kinds of stuff and I just talk about reading the news. So um, we can have a good conversation about what's going on uh, in your world, but I think this discussion will be a lot better if we you know, talk for a few minutes and then open the floor for all of you who have questions and want to know more about just startups in general, or coffee meets bagel, um, or what you would like to see in Seattle. So, yay! <laughs> because I feel like standing. Well, you know, I just don't want to stand up. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if can you guys um, introduce yourselves and give us a little bit of a description of what you do. So oh, hello guys, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you so much for having us. My name is Arum. I'm one of the three co-founders of Coffee Meets Bagel. And first of all, I really want to thank Don for putting this incredible event together. Um, you know, a few, few weeks ago, I guess now maybe months, um, when he first mentioned well, one of our um, senior Python uh, developers, Chris, first mentioned that he's part of Puppy, and that you know it's a meetup that they want to um, do an event together. I never imagined an event of this scale, and so um, thank you for you know putting this together and welcoming us. What I love about this community is just how open uh, they are and. One of our actually company value is continuous learning and I absolutely love that a lot of the events that you guys are putting together is about mentorship, coding interview, practices, etc. So thank you again, Dom, for having us. Our vision is all about inspiring singles to share and connect authentically. Um, we do this in two ways. One is through our bread and butter mobile application that uh, provides highly personalized matches for our customers single, singles every day at noon. And then the second way we also facilitate this authentic connection is through our offline initiative that we started this year. Uh, called Coffee Meets Bagel Experience that I'm really excited about. Um, and the basic idea is that our customers spend you know, a lot of time beyond the digital space to uh, connect with new people and others. And so we want it to be where our customers are. And so we're putting together this series of small and large scale 
live experiences together to uh, get our single cu uh, customers to experience what it actually means to connect authentically with one another through unique experiences. Um, so we started this company five years ago, and the unique part of the story is that I started the company with my sisters, my twin sister, uh, Daewon, and my older sister who's a designer. Uh, Sue and really the, um, the opportunity that we saw was both personal as well as sort of a business opportunity um, in that when we started looking at this industry, actually I, I, I started looking at it as part of class at business school. What was very interesting is in the past five to ten years, um, our the sheer number of singles just coming online has grown at an incredible pace. And this is largely due to lifestyle changes. Um, for example, in the US now we date about a decade longer until our first marriage um, than we did in the 70s. And largely this is driven by the fact that women are now financially independent, which is a great thing. And this trend is continuing globally and it's gonna continue. So we see a very large market opportunity. Uh, but it is a very competitive space, and the right space that we saw was basically we didn't see a product that really catered to how women like to approach dating. And women essentially look for two things. One is they really care about the quality of the people in the community. And for them, quality oftentimes means similarity. So similar hobbies, similar values, similar education. You know, Of course, physical attraction matters too, but it's one of many things they look for. And then um, the second thing they really care about is safety, um, because all, I mean, all, again, something that you know men typically wouldn't think of it as a first thing when, when they think of community to belong. So those those two have been our guiding uh, pillars as we developed Coffee Meets Bagel product. And even today, you know, we as we develop features, we look at things very. Uh, separately, distinctively for both women and men because they do behave very differently when it comes to dating. I'll pause right there. Yeah. <laughs> well, is, is that your target audience then? Is it mostly women first? So, you know, I, I get this question a lot and our target audience, we typically define them as people looking for authentic connections. So it's not really about the demographics, it's really more about the mindset. And yes, it's true that they lean more, skew more towards women, but of course there are tons of men who are looking for that authentic, deeper connections, and those are the customers that we, uh, we want to serve. How did you go from concept, though, to business plan? Because I'm sure there are a lot of people in here who have these wonderful ideas, and they're thinking, okay, how do I make this a reality for me? Yeah, how many of you guys are actually founders or thinking of starting a company at some point? Yeah, yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit of you guys, yeah. So I personally do not have um, engineering background, technology background, so I think you guys already have a huge leg up. Uh, if you're thinking of, of course, starting something in the tech space. Um, and so the way I got started really was uh, we had this concept idea, and the idea originated actually from um, this company called Guild Group that I'm sure some of you guys know it was a fashion company. They actually invented this flash sale model where they actually curate, their editors curate highly selective, you know, um, personalized goods, and it goes on sale at 12 o'clock um, every day. And we just absolutely love the fact that the, the items are personalized, so it's not overwhelming. And also, uh, really getting the customers to expect something new and fresh every day at a certain time, so that it sort of gets them to uh, develop a habit. So we thought, hey, uh, one of the big problems with um, the dating space is that even though people really like to meet other people, they are also very passive. And so, and, and on top of that, women typically, you know, uh, get overwhelmed very easily because they get a lot of attention on these platforms. So can we actually um, make the experience more personalized for all the users and also make it more like a bite-sized experience? So let's test this concept. That's how the whole thing start, started. And because I didn't have an engineering partner, I actually hired somebody out of Indonesia on a platform called um, Odesk, 
I think now it's called Upwork. And so I, uh, this Indonesian developer, I think uh, I paid him $10 an hour. It was actually quite expensive for, um, uh, I think, Indonesia standard. And I heard that Python was <laughs> good, good prototyping um, language to start with. So, you know, I didn't know much about then, but that's how I sort of selected Python as the language. And he was a Python developer. And so he helped us um, create this prototype. And basically, after very minimum sort of MVP that we put together, I had 50 of my friends actually use it for a week. And every day I was using Excel to match these, these guys. <laughs> and I actually, we actually had a feature where we were connecting them by phone, SMS at the time. And so they can actually check for real if they actually matched and liked each other. And um, I, we were sort of observing, you know, are they actually logging in every day? We were using Twilio at the time. And what we saw was the engagement was really high, even though it was just one week. It was really high, and after one week, I called every single one of the users and did a phone interview. How was it? Why did you do it? What did you like about it, etc.? And they absolutely loved it. They loved that it wasn't overwhelming. It was very streamlined. Um, and so that's when I knew that there was something here, and so we started working on it more actively. Yeah. I'm just curious, can you talk about the growth that you've had over the last five years? And then, um, you know, also, you guys can chime in on what it's like working there on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, so I mean, we've had tremendous growth, of course, in the past five years. We started in New York, and for a while, we were launching city by city, because, of course, uh, online dating, it's a, it's a local uh, business. And then, you know, at some point, as we were gaining more awareness and reputation, uh, you know, we opened it up to the entire U.S. And interestingly, now we have pockets of cities internationally also where we're getting quite a bit of uh, engagement and awareness that we really want to take advantage of. And I think, um, you know, I think the biggest sort of breakthrough came for us about three years ago when we actually went on Shark Tank. I think that's when we. You know, our name uh, really got on sort of the mainstream map um, in the in the in the U.S. and it was that was a really interesting experience. In that before that, mainly our customers were sort of the millennials, very similar to our demographics, and it's largely in coastal cities, which you know our primary audience is still today in those uh, sort of seven top U.S. cities. But after we got featured on Shark Tank we realized, wow, the sort of the diversity of our customers really uh, expanded and changed. And so that took some quite a bit of learning because some of the things that we like, for example, our algorithm, et cetera, weren't really working for, let's say, older demographics or people in you know less populated areas. So uh, yeah, we've definitely gone through some steep learning curve as we, as we expanded across the country. Um, you guys want to talk about sort of our how our company has scaled? Yeah, um, so I work on the backend engineering team um, at Gotham East Vega, and I remember when I joined, it was a team of around like five engineers, I wanna say. Um, part, some of them were also like, uh, now they are part of our data science team, which is a team of five engineers right now, so you can imagine how much we've grown. And we used to only have office in SF, right now we have, we actually have a team of five people that work out of Seattle, out of our satellite office in Seattle, and we have grown our team in SF as well to around like 12 to 14 people. Um, and yeah, it's been amazing seeing the growth um, just as a team as we've grown, as we've gone through these past few years, um, and how, how we still manage to maintain the culture even though we have like remote teams and local teams or whatever else, and like keep the, the bonds really strong. Um, and like continue to grow our code base, improve it, prune it, whatever else. And um, yeah, it's definitely uh, amazing to see how we just, uh, I want to even say like grow from like one repository to like now probably like seven to eight actively managed repositories, which is pretty phenomenal, I think. Um, so yeah, we've definitely grown a lot. Um, yeah. I've been with Coffee and Cycle for about three months now, so I'm kind of fresh in this group of people. Uh, I came in and I was sort of blown away by the combination of a, definitely a scaled out product. Like there's a very strong product 
and built up and the engineering team is a lot larger definitely than it had been but the growth seems to have been very deliberate and having like a strong focus beyond culture internally as we grow out that project and that's been just kind of awesome. how culture plays internally as well as Also, this panel is all female. How is your how is the makeup within the company, and how um, how is that working? Like, is it a women centric company? Is and now that you're having a baby, yeah. are things changing? <laughs> well, so this is my second one. Um, so, but I think um, diversity is something that now, as I have, you know, uh, been leading this company for over five years, something that I never consciously thought about at the very beginning, but over time um, learned just the incredible importance of. And, um, you know, being a company with three, of course, female founders, we've always had a um, large percentage of our uh, employees uh, who are females. I think right now it's about 50-50. I don't have the official Number. But on the engineering side, you know, for a long time, we never had any female engineers. And so, you know, I think Anne actually joined as our first female engineer. Um, and, you know, <laughs> one of the things that I, uh, big lessons I learned about diversity, the, why diversity is so important is that the perspective that is brought on by having people who have uh, different backgrounds is just something you are totally uh, ignorant of uh, uh, because you just, it's just really hard to put yourself in another person's shoes. Um, and one really good example was when I first started the company, of course a lot of us were you know in, their, in our late 20s, pretty young, and uh, we had two of our software engineers who became fathers. Um, and at the time, we didn't have any paternity or maternity policy, and I could have taken that opportunity to really set amazing paternity or maternity policy, and that was sort of my intention. But when I started, you know, talking to these two, you know, um, new fathers about, hey, what do you guys think about the, you know, putting together paternity policy? Both of them told me sort of casually, well, I don't, we're not really thinking of taking a ton of time up front. We want to take some time throughout the year and because we had flexible vacation policy, you know, they sort of said, I'll, we'll just, you know, go as the flow goes, as we see the need for it, take your, take some time here and there. And um, instead of insisting and using that opportunity as really setting a good example, I just said, okay, and then I never said anything. Um, and then when I became a parent two years ago, um, I realized when, when I went on maternity, it's like, holy shit, this is really hard. <laughs> and my husband took two weeks off, and thank God he was there, because I really don't know how I could have done that by myself. And I really felt horrible that I didn't encourage my employees to take the time off and made that process easier by setting that up before they had to go through that. Um, and so, you know, now, uh, and if they didn't have to go through it, and they didn't, you know, share some of those perspectives, like, I, this is something I would've just never known, right? And after that, I became very sensitive to even things like when we have happy hour, you know, I noticed we only have alcoholic beverages, so what about people who don't drink? You know, so things like that, as the companies grow, you really wanna make sure you're inclusive, and little things like that become, uh, it matters. And for a company that's serving such diverse set of customers, uh, I think the employees, uh, we, we need to have diversity in employee base too because we need to be considerate of our customers and I think that's how we also build better products. Um, so I'm obviously really, I feel really passionate about this. We need to do more to also recruit and foster and mentor female engineers in our company. I think we can do a lot better. Uh, but overall, this is something that we, actively think about as we uh, increase, you know, and grow our uh, company size. I was gonna ask you to elaborate more on that. How do you continue to evolve uh, and make sure that it is a great place to work 
and also to keep your um, your coworkers inspired. And then maybe you guys can talk about how you're inspired as well. Yeah, I think uh, one of the so we, we do you know company as like many other companies we do sort of formal um, you sort of uh, we have a formal channel to collect some feedback from employees, but also ongoing basis. Uh, one of our values is fearless candor. And so really being able to share your thoughts and comments and concerns freely is very important. And how you cultivate it, that is actually really hard. And uh, one key element at our company that we really, I really try to practice a lot is transparency. So whether it's about company information, how we make decisions, what's important, drivers of our business, etc. Um, we really try to be transparent about that and proactively educate all, everyone um, so that they understand what's important for our customers, who are our customers, like what are they looking for, all that stuff. Um, so education, I think, is a big piece. Communication is a big piece. And also just repeated messaging about the importance of the five, five values that we have. Our values are collaboration, continuous learning, fearless candor, um, but accountability and ownership, yeah. And so when we actually do hiring, these are the five criteria that we use. We definitely look for people who demonstrated these values, as well as when we do uh, formal evaluations or feedback, this is the criteria that we use to evaluate each other and provide feedback as well. So that's how we reinforce this culture. Um, and then the other thing that I really uh, do try to do more as we're scaling is investing in our managers because uh, without our managers, of course, it's gonna be really hard for us to maintain this culture. So those are, I, I, would, I would say, things that I would highlight about the, you know, how we plan to continue to sustain this. Yeah, I know I have been touched on this, but I wanna just emphasize how great the transparency has been. That's definitely, and sort of mind blowing to see that sort of develop a culture around just being able to talk to people and just understand the reasons behind decisions that are made and just sort of have a clear idea of what it looks like to advance and to grow with the company. I think that cycles back into a very good culture. Yeah, I'd like to add to what Arun was talking about, about feedback. Um, as an engineering team, we've grown from like five person team to a 14 person team, but what we do religiously every uh, every week during our backend team meetings is we have this time where we spend uh, like five or 10 minutes where we sit down together and we have this Google Doc where we write like what went well, what didn't go well, and what we can improve on. Um, it really gives a voice to everybody sitting in that room to like just write down whatever they have, like the frustrations or things that went well, they want to celebrate. Um, and, and the fact that we do it every week, like it just makes sure that as Coworkers, like we don't like have these pent up frustrations that just keep building. We just can speak about it, talk about it. I don't know, like vent about it to our manager, and like make sure that our voice is heard and that other people in the team know about it. And that is very important. And I'm glad that even as we've grown, we've continued to like keep that up. And um, that has definitely been crucial for us. Um, so yeah, feedback is very important. And fearless candor is. Hard to do, but it's 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 good that that is one of our like core like values, and we uh, we uh, encourage other people to be honest uh, without being afraid of the uh, consequences or whatever else. So I think that's, that's crucial. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a great culture. Um, I noticed a lot of you uh, went to the coffee meets big old table and left your resumes there. So I'm wondering if you could talk about your commitment to Seattle and what you see in the future. Yeah, um, I am, by the way, I was incredibly impressed with the, not only the turnout here, but also just the, the diversity of talents that I came across today, uh, anywhere from you know mobile engineers to data scientists. Um, I think there's um, incredible amount of tech talents here, and you know, talking about diversity and how do we grow, um, one of the things that I wasn't always a big fan of was growing team, um, uh, growing distributed teams. 
And over time, I actually realized for a small company like ours, you really, if you want to be competitive, and everything boils down to talent. Um, the success of the company really boils down to the kinds of talents that you can recruit and retain, and I absolutely believe the people uh, are everything. And so if you want to have a competitive advantage when it comes to talent recruiting, you really have to be creative about where you source people. And also, um, I, I learned that, especially uh, for sort of senior uh, talents, um, they, they have family and they want to have flexibility in terms of you know, their, uh, whether it's their hours, where they work, etc. And the work really has to serve the people not the other way around. So I really had a shift in my sort of philosophy about how companies can actually support uh, people's personal lives as opposed to vice versa. And so that meant investing a lot more in making it easy for people to be able to work remotely, not just at home, but you know somewhere else, like wherever they are, and also investing more in how we can work together effectively as distributed teams. And of course, this uh, it is a work in progress for us. Um, and so the way we're going about this is, our end vision is that we should be able to totally optimize for talents only regardless of location. Anywhere in the world that we should be able to uh, uh, find the best talents and be able to work and collaborate effectively. But that takes time and that takes practice, that takes discipline, it takes a lot of shift in mentality and your behavior change too. So we're taking baby steps at a time, and so the way we're doing that is by first forming hubs uh, where we can actually have people um, in pockets that, that can collaborate together. And so SF is one of those, of course, we are headquartered there. And San Francisco, we deliberately selected as uh, our next hub. And um, our plan is to really be able to grow engineering and product capability here. So right now, we, I think we have six engineers, um, mostly back-end Python engineers, but we really also want to commit to uh, growing our product functionality here too. So that means front-end engineering, you know, mobile engineers, and product team here. And also we're looking at um, potentially New York to uh, New York as another hub for marketing. And so this is how we want to continue to grow. And you know, definitely Seattle, we're committed to growing. I mean, we're, right now our, we're based in New York. We already had to upgrade to a you know, bigger space. But as, as, as you know, I, I can see, you know, just given the number of talents, I can, I can see how potentially you know, San Francisco, I mean, Seattle will grow rapidly. I mean, we have about 17 positions open, so we're hiring a lot of people. <laughs> Do you guys have any advice for anyone looking for a job? <laughs> Just apply. <laughs> uh, I'm not telling Kim is here, so definitely talk to her if you haven't, um, and if you're actively looking. I know that a lot of people in Copy come from a large number of alternative backgrounds, and just being able to sort of embrace that and accept like what things about you make you different when you approach a job, I think that's very key. Yeah, and, and like Erwin mentioned, like our like even in our hiring process, like we care about those core values and being able to like enunciate and like have examples of the core values that we care about is so much more is so much is as important as um, like your resume or your experience and all of that. So um, like years of experience is not what really like defines you as a person. It's really you as the, the, the values that you bring to the table is what defines you as a person. And, we really value that um, starting from the beginning, of top of the funnel of our interview process all the way to the onset. So um, definitely like, build on that and uh, be able to like highlight those things. Um, OK, so this is a basic question, but I have to ask, were any of you users of Coffee Meets Bagel before you worked there? Um, well, I wasn't because I met my husband about 10 years ago. I wish I could use my product. <laughs> uh, but I, I want to add that my co-founder, Dawn, was an um, avid user. She found several of her boyfriends through Coffee Meets Bagel. I mean, the funny thing was actually, when we were on Shark Tank, 
Uh, she was there, and one of the pictures that we presented was her boyfriend that she met on Coffee Meets Bagel. But unfortunately, by the time the show aired, they were not together anymore. So it was very awkward. But anyway, yeah, so definitely we, you know, we use our own product. Um, but, and by the way, being single is of course not a requirement to work at Coffee Meets Bagel. Uh, but you do have to have passion for connecting people. Can we talk a little bit more about, and then I, I feel like I want to make sure that everyone gets questions in so I can maybe have some final thoughts, you guys, and, um, and kind of wrap it up so people can ask questions. But in terms of funding, and maybe this is a big, bigger question, but um, you know, you went on Shark Tank and you know, you still end up getting funding other ways. Can you talk about that process? Because I think that might be an overwhelming process for people when they have an idea, they have a business plan, they want to do something, but they don't know really where to get funding. Yeah, so a fundraising, I think no matter what uh, company, what stage, etc., is always a difficult process. Uh, I think there's really no shortcut to it. You, you hear all these things on TechCrunch, blah, 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 it feels easy. There is definitely a lot of money, but it, you know, every company, every founder I know, uh, their fundraising process has always been uh, a struggle. Um, but I think the most important thing is, of course, you know, you have to believe in your vision and the product, and as long as you continue, the key really here is not giving up because uh, everyone uh, is going to, is going is going to go through tons of rejections, but it's all about just finding that one investor who's going to believe in you, right? So the first advice I would always give is expect it to be lot longer and drawn out than you think and just don't give up uh, because if you continue you will be able to find that person who's going to be able to believe in you and um, who will um, invest in you and the other sort of perspective i've developed as an entrepreneur over time is not every business really needs venture capital funding um, i think typically because you hear so much on the you know tech branch and news, et cetera, when, and when the, you know, entrepreneurs think about how they want to grow a business, and the default answer is like, oh, I need to raise venture capital funding. Uh, frankly, if I have to do it again, I'm actually uh, not sure if I would go for venture capital funding. I think now also the fundraising landscape has changed a lot, and there's um, quite a bit of alternative ways to raise money, whether it's venture debt or you know, crowdsourcing, etc. And uh, I would say not all businesses are meant for venture capital funding, and, and especially if you're thinking of, um, you know, if you sort of think about potentially how you want to uh, run, operate your business, you know, for some people having more control of your sort of destiny is really, really important, and you lose a lot of that when you raise external funding. So those are some things as founders that you, you really should be thinking about very early on because once you get that venture capital funding, you know, there's sort of no turning back. Um, so those are some things I would, I, I would tell you when it comes to fundraising. What would you do if you had to do it over again? Would you do crowdfunding? Um, I would certainly consider it. I would certainly consider it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a hard question, and, 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 but I think I would also first think about how much money do you really need to get to a s sort of sustainably profitable level where you may not need to raise money, right? And if I had to do it again, um, I may have, you know, I may want to actually really deliberately think about getting to that point earlier so that I may not have to rely on external funding for so long. Um, but in that sense, you know, at our company, we're already, you know, we have a pretty solid business model where we have revenue. And I have to say, you know, that t makes a huge difference when it comes to also just negotiating with investors because you're, you know, not completely at the whim of external funding. And we have some control over how much we can um, reinvest on our own and grow on our own. And that's been a really resource of strength for our company. Do you have any final thoughts? 
Any lasting words for everybody before we get to viewer, or I said viewer well, questions. Well, I'm very curious. <laughs> what, well, my final, one thing I, I always check at the event is, how many of you are singles here and who are not using Coffee Meets Bagel? Wow, definitely everyone who's single here should give it a try. I expect search of sign ups in Seattle today. <laughs> Try. Yes, that's my final thought, and let's open for questions. And I guess you can. Yeah, so we don't let's... have another mic, but maybe people could line up. Yeah, that's great. So let's maybe line up here. This is the widest aisle, it seems. Yeah. Come yeah. on down. Come on, let's line up over here. Oh, <laughs> oh. thanks, everyone. Thanks for giving me talk today. Uh, I use coffee too, I think it's a great app, so. <laughs> um, so I moved here from Portland two and a half months ago and I've been volunteering with a talk a nonprofit called PDX with Women in Technology. And so it's a nonprofit that pushes for more diversity in tech. And I'm still volunteering with them. I'm going to give a five minute talk in a month. So I'm always looking for more pointers, in specifically um, when addressing the issue of machine learning, engineering, and data science, and how there will, A, continue to be a shortage in that space, forecasted in the future, and B, that shortage among a diverse crowd will be extra, you know, greater the shortage. So any thoughts about getting more women in Machine learning, engineering, and data science in that field would be appreciated. Wow, wow, that's a really I mean, I, I don't think this is particular, maybe it's particularly um, more dire in machine learning engineering, but I think in general, um, you know, computer science, um, engineering, STEM area is where we obviously see shortage of women and also even just entrepreneurship. You know, females are you know, still quite a bit minority, and even investment, investing, right? When I pitch to investors, I've probably pitched at this point to hundreds of investors. I pitched to three female investors uh, in the history. So I think there are a lot of areas where women are still a uh, significant you know, minority. And um, my viewpoint is you really have to start early. And um, I mean, now I, I now that I also have chil you know, children, I think about this more, and we, as, as founders, we sometimes you know, get together and talk about why is it that women are uh, so underrepresented. And I think historically, actually, uh, what I read was um, sort of like early in the 60s and 70s, actually, women in engineering uh, was significantly higher. Um, and over time, I think a lot of the whether it's um, sort of industry perception of what software engineers should look like, really sort of excluded, um, and this visually, you know, the, the typical software engineer you think about is the, I don't know, guys in t-shirt and the nerdy guys, you know, typing, and it's, it's, it's sort of excluded women. And so I think there has to be, a, from very early on, educationally as well as at home, there, there has, to, has to be active encouragement um, because these sort of happen over a long period of time, and I don't think we can like just switch your, you know, like a light bulb one day and say, okay, you know, I'm gonna be going into STEM field or, you know, investment field, etc. I think this this has to happen over time. How did you guys get into computer? I mean, um, software engineering. Okay, so my story is I was inspired by my brother, uh, who was also uh, a software engineer. But I think to answer your question, um, I had an interesting conversation with uh, one of my friend's sister, who is now in high school. And she was asking me, she was like, oh, what do you do for work? And I was telling her I'm an engineer. And she was like, oh, so you did, do you just code all day? And I was like, kind of. And she, she was like, where do you work? And I was like, I work in a dating app. And she. She was so fascinated that like coding could be um, somehow applied in the dating field. So I think sometimes, um, like traditionally, like I don't know if this is a generalization that I'm making, but like 
oh, girls might be more inclined to like creative fields or um, I don't know, medical fields. I I'm not sure, but um, I feel like sometimes many people out there just don't know that you can apply like coding to any and every field. Like it can be like for instance, Stitch Fix is another example where you can apply your skills to like uh, the fashion industry um, or the medical industry is highly in need for people that have technical skills and uh, you, you can apply these like coding skills like anywhere and that that power is just so so great that I think just encouraging like younger yeah definitely the younger generation to like like for, could continue it might be difficult but it's so worth it because you can do so much with it um, it's just uh, and, and, and like like highlighting the applications of um, uh, like computer skills is definitely crucial and like encourage and like support that and um, and and give the examples of people who are like in in the field and who are like well known these days I guess um, yeah. I want to touch on that as well. I think some of those topics that I think everyone wants to say something on. Uh, the increasing number of people in the pool is an amazing thing to, to strive for. And I think that both, both people have said things that are very useful to that. But I think a, another point is to make sure that the environment that you're hiring women into is one that is inclusive and comfortable. Uh, making sure that you develop a culture that can keep the women that you hire. Hi, um, I kind of have two questions. I'm not sure how to go about this. Should I just ask? Go. Okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I guess the first question um, would be how, uh, what kind of advice or experiences would you share with women from uh, non-traditional, non-CS backgrounds who want to kind of make a breakthrough to tech, and um, like, you know, just what kind of stories do you have that could inspire us? And uh, my second question is uh, kind of a longer one because um, I'm an avid user of Coffee Beats Bagel, I'm in college right now, and <laughs> I tell my friends all the time that they should not be using other apps and they should really give this a try, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's getting there. And um, I admire your value of creating authentic connections, and um, I was at another conference where the CEO of Bumble kind of talked about uh, installing a new functionality into their app where it allows the users to kind of like go on hiatus and that kind of um, feature will, uh, um, how do I put this, will um, empower the individual in a different sense apart from just, you know, like uh, just going out there and creating connections all the time. They can have the power to like, take a step back. And I'm just wondering if Coffee Meets Bagel have any um, plans for uh, kind of improving the functionality of the app to uh, to empower individuals even further. Like, what kind of ideas do you have for the future of the app? How do you see uh, that it can be improved? And um, yeah, I'll just love to hear your opinions on those two things. I'd love to touch on the first one. I kind of wandered my way into into technology from a bio and theater background. Uh, and I think that, I don't really touch on a particular story, but for me the things that have stood out has really been about the people. Uh, the peers and the mentors that you meet and the people that will kind of remind you that you can do the things that you're doing, that you're not crazy and that you're empowered to, to move forward in your career. Um, so I I have a story. <laughs> so my sister-in-law, she was a math teacher um, for a long period of time, and uh, she met my my brother, and he's a software engineer. And for the, for the longest, she she like most people thought a software engineer would be just like some some nerd like walking around with like a hoodie, and like um, she didn't really know like what coding was, even though you would think of like math majors being really like. Like, it's very similar to like the CS backgrounds, um, or you can apply your math skills in, in the computer science or technology world, but she didn't even realize that there could be an application for a math major to probably code someday, and 
Currently, she is um, a data science engineer, and she loves it. Like, she loves applying the, the math skills that she has to like view projections and whatever else. And um, one of her goals is to finally end up uh, working at NASA someday. But she has two kids right now, so she's putting that <laughs> on hold for a little bit. <laughs> so it's not. So she has more of a flexible job, flexible job right now. But um, again, I guess it was just there. The, the mismatch over there for her was she just didn't realize like what it took to like code or what it took to apply her math skills uh, in something that could that could be um, like applicable in, in the technology world or like build something different uh, with those skills. So um, yeah, I think educating people a little bit more that regardless of what background you come from, you can definitely apply your skills in creative ways and technology is one um, vehicle for that or vessel for that and um, if you and, and it's it's easy to it, it, I wouldn't say it's easy to learn but it's something that you can learn like any other skill like uh, playing the piano or whatever it just requires like practice and that that passion and yeah definitely just yeah the, the, those, don't, don't let those dreams or um, the fire in your mind like die <laughs> but, yeah um, I'll just uh, touch on your second question I think there's Tons of product innovation to be still had in this um, in this space, and one area that we internally think about a lot is how do we bring more positivity to the, the dating space? Because one of the things that we know that singles uh, who use multiple dating services and who are looking is that there is a lot of fatigueness. Um, singles are sort of tired of being ghosted be ignored. Um, when we actually talk to our customers, their biggest fear often is not ever being taken seriously by others because people have so many options. And so uh, we, we talk about a lot internally, how do we bring more positivity into this space? How do we get people to take this more with optimism rather than skepticism that, oh, nobody's taking this seriously? And um, what we want to do more of, whether through this product or some other initiative, is rather than having singles taking, uh, you know, look at this as a sort of a binary outcome. Either I have to meet my princess charming or prince charming in eight weeks, otherwise this is a total waste of time and failure. Um, <laughs> rather than looking at this binary outcome like that, really being able to look at this more as a discovery process more as a personal journey where you have this opportunity to interact with others and through that uh, be able to discover more about yourself, others, and even about the world. And so in that sense, we think a lot about whether it's through content or features, etc. how do we actually be more of a partner to our audience um, who, to, to be with them through this journey, whether it's through coaching or helping them in other way. And so those are the types of features that we're proactively thinking about, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to innovate in that. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. Unfortunately, yeah. it's more of a cultural or philosophical question. It's not engineering or recruiting. But oh, by the way, you single ladies, I'm already taken. <laughs> Uh, this is for Arun. Are you having a boy or a girl? And what do you dream about for your baby? Oh, wow. I'm having a boy. This is my second boy. Um, you know, to be honest, I've been so busy dreaming about coffee meets bagel and its future <laughs> that I really have not had a lot of uh, time to think about the dreams for my boy. but. Um, you know, one thing that I really envision for the future is um, I, I've been getting a lot more involved um, with sort of female founders and how we can also help future female founders to be more, uh, to encourage them to, get, to start companies and uh, get into entrepreneurship. And I get asked a question like, in the future, uh, do you think there will be a time where there's no such thing as, you know, female founder? It's such a not a big deal anymore uh, that you know, because we have female founder conferences and female founder speaking opportunities right now, but that none of those things would ever actually exist because 
it's completely equal, right? I think that's such a, it feels like a very revolutionary thing today, but I really envision that future, and I think that takes a lot of effort on both female and male parts today, and also as parents educating our boys uh, to, um, to you know, not think about gender in specific way, gender specific roles, and so uh, I, yeah, the the dream that I have for the future generation is where um, females are not minorities anymore, and there isn't something special about being a female founder. Thank you. Hi, uh, you may have touched on this a little bit, but I, um, a success on your platform means you lose a customer, right? Mm -hmm. So can you tell us a little bit how you think about that tension? Yeah, I get this question a lot uh, um, from investors too. And so the way we think about churn is, like any companies, every company has churn, we think about it as both positive and negative churn. So when people leave our platform because they had success, that's considered positive churn. And we love that because when you look at our users who left because they had successful experience on Hoffman Meets Bagel, during the time in which they were using the service, not only uh, do they you know, um, spend more money, so their lifetime value is actually significantly higher than those who don't have a successful experience, but also, in general, they also bring a lot more friends as um, users. And so the referral value is very, very significant. We think people who have had success in our platform as the biggest ambassadors for our product. Um, and so we actually love having positive churns. Now the churn that we worry about, of course, is negative churn, just like any other companies where people are leaving because they, they didn't have a successful experience. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, my name is Andrew Powers. Uh, I actually got inspired by the first person who asked the question about how we got into the industry and what really pushed you in. A um, little background, I run a nonprofit which is a mobile maker space that brings new emerging technologies to underrepresented youth so they can create such sustainable communities. Um, my question, if I can actually form it, is how do you connect with social impact? What is that actual focus on creating some social some sort of social impact or engaging with nonprofits so that you can increase your reach, not just for profit or uh, market gain, but really actually making an impact. Yeah, um, so I think, so from Coffee Meets Bagel perspective, you know, we haven't done proactively specific initiatives with nonprofit organizations yet. However, you know, one of the things that we found out about our customers, so we we try to really understand, you know, what's important to our customers, our main uh, brand lovers, and being involved in the community and uh, making a social impact is definitely one of the things that's really uh, near and dear to uh, our own customers. And so, um, to the extent that we've done um, initiatives, uh, you know, I think about two years ago, we actually partnered with uh, somebody named Dr. Mike, who actually was voted as you know, People Magazine's 50 most eligible bachelor. Um, really this very attractive looking doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and who was actually trying to use that opportunity, the sort of the, I'm like that he was starting to get through this social media presence, et cetera, to do something good. And so we reached out to this doctor and said, hey, we actually want to help you raise money for a nonprofit organization that you recently founded. And so the whole initiative was um, people could actually donate money to his foundation and we would actually do a raffle at the end and the person who gets picked would go on this dream date with Dr. Mike. Um, and we had this whole day planned uh, with him, et cetera, and it was a phenomenally successful marketing initiative. And we definitely want to do more of this um, directly uh, uh, so impactful um, initiatives, whether it's through, whether it's a marketing campaign or maybe it could even be part of a sustainable sort of an ongoing 
evergreen feature in the product, but something that we definitely want to get into more. I think in general, the way we think about how we're making the biggest impact, of course, right now is helping people find a partner so that they can have more fulfilling life. And I think that's obviously a very big social impact because I think especially now, um, this generation, I think loneliness is one of the biggest sort of um, sufferings that people have, which is very ironic because we live in such a connected world, but yet this generation feels very isolated. And so that's a, that's a mission that we ver feel very passionate about it, but I think there's a lot more we can do actually with, specifically with nonprofit organizations down the road. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, that remote working and getting actual activity, not in just one geographical location, is a perfect way to increase diversity. Uh, this next question will be our last question, and then we'll have a short break. And we got more stuff. Hi, my name is Linda. Um, so I'm wondering, how I really resonate with your mission of empowering leaders and um, promoting diversity, as well as empowering um, genuine relationship. Um, I'm wondering, do you have examples of how you promote your five pillars in your workspace? You know, one of the things that um, that I believe, because every company probably has some values or you know cultural philosophies they they adhere to, but oftentimes it's not practiced. It's something that they put it on the wall and people forget about it. It's in the handbook, etc. So one thing that was really important for us is how do we actually make sure that this is practiced and reminded every day. And the um, important way to do that is actually making that as part of your everyday language. Because through the use of language, people are reminded and that's how I think it transforms into behavior. So one very simple example of how we actually use this in an everyday language is we have a way to recognize our peers um, for anything they do, but you do it uh, by using sort of hashtag, we do it through Slack, or you can do it verbally, but every recognition is tied to one of our five values. And so this way people are actually reminded of when you want to recognize somebody of the values, and when others are reading it on a daily basis, they're also reminded of the five values. So that's one simple example of how we actually practice this. To add on to that, uh, we used to do this thing during our all hands uh, that, that was every week where uh, we would just give a shout out to those people who were mentioned on the Slack channel uh, about like, what happened and why somebody else recognized it. We also had uh, a thing, so this was called like cheers for peers um, and uh, we would recognize that, but we also had oops the monkey where people could also um, like be proactive about the mistakes they made or the learnings they had, and we continue to do that today. Where uh, we're still a small company, and we still have um, a lot of instances where things just don't go the way we expect it to go, or like bugs are released, or um, product features just don't land the way we expect it to land. And uh, it could be because of a mistake or something happened. Um, but we are proactive about like owning up to those things and. Um, sharing with the company how we can either avoid these things in the future or how what we learned from this uh, experience. So I think, again, just like the, the, the level of transparency that Selena was talking about is just really high where we not only like uh, celebrate people, but we also like are able to feel comfortable like owning up to things that we learned or probably didn't do so well. Um, that's, yeah, it's really powerful. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I think that is it for the panel. I just want to go ahead and say thank you to everyone who was part of the panel. Uh, Michelle, thank you for participating and leading this effort. Thank you. There's no way I would have done anywhere near as good of a job at all, even slightly, so I'm glad someone took that off my plate. Typically, those tasks go to me, unfortunately. Uh, anyway, so we're going to do a quick break, about 10 minutes, and then we're going to get back. I've got a bunch of content for you after we get back. We literally have nine more talks for you. They're all lightning talks, so they're short, <laughs> but they are going to be super interesting because they're all from a bunch of data science grads. Uh, one of them involves puppies because, well, this is puppy, right? Uh, so you can look forward to that one, uh, and you'll have to 
you have to stick around for that. So, a uh, quick 10-minute break. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll yell at people in the back in the room, but there's more uh, drinks, there should be some more food. Uh,